Lynn, over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much. So, so Brandy's given the perspective of um, the sponsor looking across their options for, for what they need to answer a question in a data-driven manner. And I'm going to speak from the perspective of a data aggregator um, that uh, has a sponsor that may be coming to them or has a question that's been um, developed by a nonprofit or a government coming to us to ask a question. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is just an example of an existent data warehouse, and this happens to be the Optum Labs data warehouse. Um, there are different, there are other data aggregators who may have similar pictures. Maybe the boxes are filled differently, but in the Optum Labs data warehouse, for example, we have um, all this data is de-identified. It's linked with an encrypted ID number, and in our environment, we um, link and then de-identify. So the linkage is done um, by, you know, via approval and in, in a different location than we warehouse our data and then we put the data in a de-identified format with an encrypted ID into our warehouse. Optum Labs has um, about 30 partners, academic institutions, nonprofits, um, HHS is a partner and they can access the data through a virtual desktop environment. So we don't ship out the data, it's, it, it's accessed via a tunneling into our environment. So for example, in our data warehouse, we happen to have administrative claims at the top. We've got some other data assets that come to us because of our relationship with the health plan. So we have lab test results that are affiliated with our claims data. We don't have to go to a medical record to get the test results, they're actually associated with our claims. We have health risk assessment data, we have information about benefit design, some socioeconomic status data. We have death data, but um, Jeff discussed some of the challenges that everyone is having with the, with the SSA death master file. On the bottom of this picture are other data assets we've linked. We have an EHR data asset, we have some consumer data from AARP, we've linked in the area health resource file, and then we always leave room for the growth of our asset. So as a data aggregator, when I, when I have a question that, that comes to me, this is what I'm looking at in terms of my resource. Optum Labs does not re-identify data for the purposes of research, but other parts of Optum do. So the contour study that Brandy mentioned was done by um, Optum Life Sciences. Um, m before I joined Optum Labs, that's a group that I was part of, and we did exactly what, what, what Brandy did, discussed under I or B approval. Um, and with patient consent, went out and collected additional data and linked it. But Optum Labs does not de-identify its data assets. So, you know, Brandy mentioned that we're, we're going to be oversimplifying this task. It would take all day to, to outline the process we go through when talking about the quality of data elements and mapping out the decision process. But when I think about sort of my cheat sheet, when someone comes to me with a question, this is essentially the process that I'm going through. So first, um, do the required data elements and the sample exist within the asset that I have? Do I have population sizes? Do I have power? Do I have enough for subpopulation analysis? Do I have the exposure, the outcome, the covariates, the confounders that I need? And can I deal with special issues? Do I need repeated measures? Do I need those measures to occur around a seminal event? For example, if I'm looking at um, diabetics and hemoglobin A1C, do I need a hemoglobin A1C that falls in the temporal range of a change in therapy, for example? Second, what's the data quality and provenance of the variables? And this is what the data quality section of Duke Margolis is working on. Um, the quality standard may vary given the question, is this marketing research or is this for regulatory purposes? Those are very different standards for the quality and understanding of the data asset. Has the linkage been assessed well? Do we know that we link the data appropriately and, and with, a, with an accurate match rate? Um, what's the reliability and validity of the elements? Do the logical relationships hold between data assets that we link together? Do we have completeness in the data that's sufficient for the question being asked? Do we understand the provenance of the data? So the, the document that you have in front of you uh, refers to this as the chain of custody. And do we have sufficient knowledge of the impact of these quality issues? If something isn't satisfied or we haven't met a particular quality standard, do we know what the impact of that is? Um, can sources and impact of bias be addressed? So can we address and do we understand issues that missing data may cause? Do we understand representativeness? Um, there's the present patient bias. So if we see a patient in an observational asset, it means they sought care. What about the patients who don't appear in the asset at all? And then there are some special issues, and I'll go into these a little bit further later, but things like benefit design, if you're working with insurance data, has a huge impact on the events and information that you're going to see in that data. 
Are there state and federal policies that are affecting the data that appears in your data asset? There are local issues. For example, um, is, the, is the Walgreens chain in a particular state running a very aggressive disease management program? That can affect the data that shows up in an observational data environment. So there are issues like that that, um, that we have to be on top of. So now, you know, for, for those of you who love data, I never knew my hobby was going to become my profession, um, I'm going to show some examples from real data. And I'm going to focus on largely EHR examples, so examples from, from electronic health records. And that's because I think that this is the, the newest source that's coming to play into the, the regulatory environment. And also, um, it's the least understood, I think, and it has, has the most variety. If you're working with administrative claims, which is a very common asset, to use, Jeff mentioned it in the Friends of Cancer Research work. It's fairly well understood, and I can work in multiple administrative claims assets and understand the issues involved. EHR data assets vary widely um, from aggregator to aggregator. Okay, so here's an example of the question, you know, do the variables exist and what's the quality of these variables? This is the MMSE, the mini mental status exam. This is a test, 30 point or 30 question test that's given to patients to look at progression of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And here's an example. Now, all the data that I use here is, is created manufactured data. I'm not showing any real patient data, but it looks very much like this. So here um, are the columns that we would see in a data asset, the patient ID, the date of the patient note, the type of measure, and there's the MMSE, the measure value, so that's essentially the score on the test, Measure details like the units. So if this was a drug, it would be milligrams. Here it's um, a little bit more ambiguous because it's a, it's a patient-reported outcome. The notes section, and then the measure date. And MMSE is not um, data that comes to a structured field, at least in our EHR data asset. And I would imagine that that's true in most cases. So this element was extracted via natural language processing from physician notes. So when you're working with this data, the first thing we had to do is decide what units of analysis are we going to, what units of this measure are we going to accept? And you can see that there are some units that look like the right measure out of 30. Um, 30 date equals today. I'm not sure what that means, but I think that that's something we, we might look at and say, hmm, that's probably an okay unit of measure because you really don't need a unit of measure on this score. But we have to rule out some of these as not making any sense. What do you see when the measurement detail is 27, for example? Is that actually the score and it was misplaced? It's ambiguous, and you can't just assume that that was a, you know, something you can just sort of ignore or overlook. So first, which units are we going to deem acceptable? Second, we look at the values. This is a numeric measure. It should be score from 0 to 30, and we still have some of these odd um, text values that we really can't use in analysis. And then finally, you have to look at the distribution of the measure in time. And I'm sorry, the distribution of the numeric measure. So how many of these measures actually fall in range? So this is what it looks like after we've cleaned it. And what we found here is that we had 107,000 individuals in our data asset that had MMSE. And among these patients, um, two was the mean number of, of measures that appeared. Even after cleaning, however, look at this. We have a patient who has two values on the same date, and they're different. So we've cleaned the data, and there's an impact of cleaning, right? You've dropped values due to the fact that there was dirty data and messy data. We've cleaned the values, but we still have something that doesn't look right. Is this a restatement of the measure from the last visit? So did the NLP pick up a statement like, at the last visit, the patient's score was 28. Now the patient's score is 26. That's possible. But as we're cleaning, we're making a great deal of assumptions about the data that can affect our findings. Here's another example, missing data. So we talk about um, EHR data potentially um, missing some clinical encounters. Claims data is theoretically a closed system, so we think that we have all the utilization during certain time periods. Each of the icons in this picture represents one million patient days. And the red, reddish color are dates that only appeared in the EHR. So these are encounter days that only appeared in the electronic medical record. The gray are dates that appeared in both. So we assume encounters that occurred in the EHR data, and we also find them in the claims. And then the yellow is what most of us would expect, that there's lots and lots of clinical encounters that we only see in the claims data. But the red is what surprises most people. Why do we have encounter days that only appear in the EHR data and not in the claims when we assume the claims to be sort of the gold standard for utilization events? <clears throat> Another example, and this was done um, with our partners at Mayo, this looked at um, appearance of MI and how much 
were, how many patients had aspirin use? And this was originally for quality measurement purposes, but essentially you can think of this as an example of how can you look at drug exposure in a population. And the point of this slide is to show the variance in the apparent data quality by source. So that first column is a, an encrypted identifier of the source ID. The Optum Labs Data Warehouse has now over 80 different sources supplying data into its EHR research database. And it's important to understand that each one of those sources, and these are different platforms, they, they are not all the same EHR platform, um, each source may process the data differently. And this is a real key to understand about provenance of the data, that each of these sources may be handling the different the data differently, may be sending certain types of data and not others, may only be sending us data from their outpatient clinics and maybe not their ER, maybe not their inpatient, um, maybe their oncology clinic isn't sharing data. So we have to understand. So here you can see um, sort of what we would expect is the top row. So source number 0002, um, there were 483 AMI hospitalizations. 100% of these sources indicated that some type of medication was delivered to these patients. So any medication delivered, 100%, and the rate of aspirin delivery that was apparent was 97.3%. The rest of the rows indicate something um, that may be problematic. So for example, um, S0041, 15,000 events, Medication delivered in only 84% of cases. That indicates to me that something is wrong there. All patients in hospital get some type of medication delivery. There shouldn't be any patient with no record of medication delivery in, in an inpatient encounter. So there's something wrong uh, with the data asset there. And if we hadn't looked at the individual data by source ID, we would have just gone with this aggregate number and said, bing, bam, boom, here it is. This is the rate of aspirin use. <clears throat> Uh, I think this is my last example. This is a, a, a one of the opioid key performance indicators that Optum Labs has created, and these are publicly available. There's a Health Affairs blog that shows all of them. But one of the measures was concurrent exposure to opioids and benzodiazepines, and we created our original key performance indicators in administrative claims data. So the orangish bars are showing this um, concurrent medication rate in the claims, and then I recreated the measure in our EHR data asset, and you can see that the measure is substantially lower in EHR, and, and those of us who use EHR data would not be surprised by this. Um, EHR data only shows the number of medica the, the medications that are written for the patient, not necessarily filled. Refills are not well reflected. Now, in the case of opioids, typically in most states, you need another prescription written in order to get another, um, you know, another day supply of opioids. So I was a little bit surprised to see how big the difference was between these, because I thought, given opioids, we would capture the exposure fairly well. But the point here is that medication exposure may not necessarily be well tracked in an EHR database. <clears throat> Um, so, so finally, some of the special issues that you have to think about in real world data that um, you, know, you may not give consideration to if it's not your everyday life to deal with these data. For example, benefit, benefit design and coverage policy. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. The way that the benefits are designed for a patient is going to affect what claims data looks like, for example. So are there at-risk contracts? Are there bundled payments? Um, are patients funneled to centers of excellence? It's very difficult to look at transplant outcomes, for example, in a database where all the patients are being treated at a center of excellence. You're getting a very biased picture of what those outcomes are going to look like. Um, our service is capitated. That's going to affect how you look at cost data, and sometimes it's going to mask the occurrence of events in the data. Um, the data features themselves. If you're trying to look at infants, for example, they are very often attached to the mother's record for several days after birth. This affects how we can look at immediate outcomes after birth because the mother and the infant's records are sometimes getting tangled up together. Um, coordination of benefits with Medicare can create interesting anomalies in the data. Uh, we lack device brand names in administrative claims data and very often in EHR data. Um, variations in lab processing. We did some work recently with the FDA just to look at differences in the processing of lab data in these data sources. Um, and, and, and it can really have an effect on what you're seeing in terms of measurement of clinical outcomes. Federal, state, and local variants can affect things. State laws that regulate specific medications. Um, as I mentioned before, you may have very strong disease management programs at the state, local, and community level in certain geographies. And then finally, the realities of healthcare delivery. There's drug sampling. That effect affects our ability to measure exposure to, to drug therapy. Um, sites of service, patients who are receiving care in um, uh, 
in dialysis clinics, for example, it's hard to get the clinical information out of that because it's often hidden within the, the, site, uh, the site of care information that's held onto by the dialysis clinic. And cash pay. So if patients pay cash for services, including prescriptions um, or non-covered services, we can't de detect those events in the data. So all of these um, really important details about how the data come to be can affect our ability to accurately identify clinical outcomes, measures, um, costs, for example, in, in a real-world data asset. Thank you Thank very you. much, Lynn.